Chapter 1 Two Walls I begin my story with an experience from the time I was 10 years old and attending the grammar school in a small town. Many memories are wafted to me, touching me inwardly with melancholy and with pleasurable thrills, narrow dark streets and bright houses and steeples, the chiming of clocks and people's faces, rooms filled with hominess and warm comfort, rooms filled with mystery and profound fear of ghosts. There is a smell of cozy confinement of rabbits and servant girls, of home remedies and dried fruit. Two worlds coincided there, day and night issued from two poles. One world was my father's house, but it was even more restricted than that. It actually comprised only my parents. For the most part, this world was very familiar to me. It meant mother and father love and severity, exemplary manners and schools. This was the world of a warm glow, clarity and cleanliness, gentle, friendly speech, washed hands, clean clothes and proper behavior were at home here. Here the morning choral was sung, here Christmas was celebrated. In this world, there were straight lines and paths leading to the future. There were duty and guilt, a troubled conscience and confession, forgiveness and good resolutions, love and respect, Bible sayings and wisdom. This was a world to adhere to if one's life was to be bright and pure, lovely and well-ordered. On the other hand, the other world began right in our own house. It was altogether different, smelled different, spoke differently, made different promises and demands. In the second world, there were maids and journeymen, ghost stories and scandalous rumors. There was the mortal flow of uncanny, tempting, frightening, puzzling things. Things like slaughterhouse and jail. Drunks and bickering women, cows giving birth, horses collapsing, stories of burglaries, killings, suicides, all these beautiful and scary, wild and cruel things existed all around, in the next street, in the next house, policemen and vagrants ran around, drunks beat their wives, cluster of young girls poured out of the factories in the evening. Old women could cast a spell on you and make you sick. Bandits lived in the woods. Arsonists were caught by the constabulary. This second violent world gushed out fragrantly everywhere except in our rooms where mother and father were. And that was very good. It was wonderful that here among us there was peace, order and repose duty and a clear conscience, forgiveness and love, and wonderful that all the rest existed. All those nasty, glaring, stumble, and violent things were nevertheless could be escaped with a single bound towards one's mother. And the strangest thing of all was how the two worlds bordered each other, how close together they were, for example, when our maid Lena sat by the parlor door at her evening prayers and joined in the hymn with her bright voice, her scrubbed hands flat on her smooth down apron, she belonged totally with father and mother, with us, with brightness and correctness. Immediately afterward, in the kitchen or wood shed, when she told me the story of the hairless gnome or wrangled with female neighbors in the little butcher shop. She was somewhere else. She belonged to the other world. She was enveloped in mystery. And so it was with everything, especially with myself. Naturally, I belonged to the bright and correct world. I was my parents' child. 
but wherever i turned my eyes and ears the other world was there and i lived in it too even though it was often unfamiliar and uncanny to me even though i regularly got pangs of conscience and anxiety from it in fact at times i preferred to live in the forbidden world and frequently my return to home to the bright realm no matter how necessary and good that might be was almost like a return to a some place less beautiful more boring and dreary at times i knew my goal in life was to become like my father and mother just as bright and pure superior and well ordered as they but that was a long road to travel before you got there you had to attend schools and study and take tests and exams and the road constantly led you alongside that other darker world the right through it so that was quite possible to get struck there and go under there were stories of prodigal sons to whom that had happened i had read them excitedly their return home to their father and a good life was always so satisfying and splendid i realized keenly that that was the only proper good and desirable outcome but the part of my story that took place among the wicked and the lost was the far the more appealing and if one were free to share and admit it it was sometimes actually a downright shame that the prodigal repented and was found again but one didn't say that and didn't even think it the idea was merely somehow present as a premonition or possibility deep down in your mind when i visualized the table i could quite easily imagine him down the street disguised or clearly identifiable or else at the fair or in a tavern but never in our house my sisters also belong to the bright world it often seemed to me that their nature was closer to our fathers and mothers they were better more well behaved for less compared to me they had shortcomings they could be naughty but as i saw it that wasn't very serious it wasn't at it was with me in my case contact with evil was often so burdensome and torturing the dark world was much nearer at hand like my parents my sisters were people to be protected and honored after any fight with them my own conscience declared me to be the one in the wrong the instigator the one who had to ask forgiveness for by insulting my sisters i was insulting my parents the good and imposing faction there were secrets i could much sooner share with the corset street boys than with my sisters on good days days of brightness and an untroubled conscience it was often delightful to play with my sisters to be good to them and well behaved and to see myself in a fine and noble aura that's how it must be to be an angel that was the highest goal within our ken and we imagined it was sweet and wonderful to be an angel enveloped in bright music and fragrant like christmas and happiness oh how seldom it was possible to live such hours and days often while playing playing good in offensive permissible games i became too excited and violent for my sisters to put up with this led to arguments and unhappiness and when anger overcame me at such times i was a terror chewing and saying things whose vileness i felt deeply and painfully at the very moment i did and said them then came waxing dark hours of regret and contrition and then the awful moment when i asked to be forgiven and then once again a ray of brightness a silent 
grateful sense of undivided happiness that would last hours or only moments. I attended grammar school. The mayor's son and the son of the chief forest ranger were in my class and visited me sometimes. Though wild boys, they nevertheless belong to the good, permissible world. And yes, I had close relations with neighbor boys who went to the ordinary elementary school. Boys we usually look down on. It's one of them that I must begin my story. On one afternoon, when there were no classes, I was not much more than 10 years old. I was hanging around with two boys from the neighborhood. Then a bigger boy joined us. A blurry, rough fellow of about 13 from the elementary school, the son of a trailer. His father drank and his whole family had a bad reputation. I knew Franz Cromer well and I was afraid of him so that I didn't like his joining us then. He already acted like a grown-up man, mimicking the walk and speech habits of the young factory laborers. With him as leader, we went down to the river bank next to the bridge and hid from the world under the first arch of the bridge. The narrow bank between the vaulted bridge wall and the sluggishly flowing water consisted entirely of refuse, broken crockery and junk. Tangled clusters of rusty wire and other rubbish. Sometimes usual items could be found there. Under Franz Cromer's direction, we had to examine the stretch of ground and show him what we discovered. Then he either pocketed it or threw it into the water. He ordered us to pay special attention to any lead, brass, or chewer items that might be there. He pocketed them all as well as an old horn comb. I felt very tense in his presence, not only because I knew my father would forbid me to associate with him if he knew about it, but out of fear of Franz himself. I was glad that he took me along and treated me like the others. He gave orders and we obeyed as if it were an old custom, even though I was with him for the first time. Finally, we sat down on the ground. Franz spat into the water and looked like a grown man. He spat through a gap in his teeth and could hit any mark he aimed at. A conversation began, and the boys started boasting and showing off, relating all sorts of schoolboy heroics and mischievous pranks. I kept silent but was afraid that this very silence would draw attention to me and make Cromer angry at me. From the outset, my two companions had withdrawn from me and gone over to his side. I was a stranger among them and I felt that my clothing and manners provoked them. As a grammar school pupil and a rich kid, I couldn't possibly be popular with France and I was well aware that the minute it came to that, the other two would disavow me and leave me in the church. At last, out of pure fear, I started telling a story too. I made up an elaborate tale of thievery, making myself the hero. My story was that, in an orchard near the corner mill, along with a friend, I had stolen a sack full of apples at night. And not just ordinary apples, but exclusively rhinets and golden pearmines, the best varieties. I took refuge in this story from the dangers of the moment. I was a fluent inventor and teller of tales. In order not to finish too soon, and thus perhaps became involved in something worse, I showed off all my inventive skills. One of us, I narrated, had to stand guard the whole time that the other one was in the tree throwing down the apples. And the sack was so heavy that we finally had to open it again and leave half the apples behind. 
but we returned a half hour later and fetched the rest. When I was finished, I hoped for a little applause. I had gradually become enthusiastic and intoxicated by my own yarn spinning. The two younger boys were silent in expectation, but Franz Cromer looked at me penetratingly through half-closed eyes and asked me in a menacing voice, Is that true? Yes, I said. So it's really and truly so. Yes, re really and truly. I defiantly affirmed while choking inwardly with anxiety. Can you swear to it? I got very frightened, but I immediately said yes. Then say, by God and my salvation, I said, by God and my salvation. All right then, he said and he turned away. I thought that was the end of it and I was glad when shortly afterward he stood up and started walking back. When we were on the bridge, I timidly said that I had to go home. Don't be in such a hurry, Franz laughed. After all, we are going the same way. He sauntered ahead slowly, and I didn't dare to make a break for it. But he did actually walk toward a house. When we were there, when I saw a house door with its thick brass knob, the sunshine in the windows and a curtain in my mother's room, I drew a deep breath of relief. Oh, I was back home. Oh, I made a good blessed return home. A return to brightness and peace. When I opened the door quickly and slipped inside, prepared to close it behind me, Franz Cromer pushed his way in too. He stood beside me in the cool, dark passage with its style flow where the light came only from the yard. He held me by the arm and sat quietly. Hey, you, don't rush away like that. I looked at him in fright. His grip on my arm was as hard as iron. I thought about his possible intentions and whether he might want to hit me. If I were to call out now, I thought, call out loudly and violently, would someone from upstairs show up fast enough to rescue me? But I decided not to. What is it? I asked. What do you want? Not much. I just have to ask you something else. The others don't need to hear it. Is that right? Well, what else I am supposed to tell you? I have got to go up the stairs, you know? Franz said quietly, I'm sure you know who owns the orchard by the corn mill. No, I don't. I think the miller. Franz had flung his arm around me and now he drew me very close to himself so that I was forced to look directly into his face. His eyes were malicious. He had a nasty smile and his face was full of cruelty and power. Yes, boy, I am the one who can tell you who owns the orchard. I have known for some time that the apples were stolen. And I also knew that the man said he would give two marks to whoever could tell him who stole the fruit. My God, I exclaimed, but you won't tell him anything, will you? I felt that it would be useless to appeal to his sense of honor. He came from that other world. For him, backstabbing was no crime. I was completely convinced of that. In matters like this, the people from the other world weren't like us. Not tell him anything. Cromer laughed. My dear friend, do you think I am a counterfeiter and can make my own two mark pieces? I am a poor guy. I don't have a rich father like you. And whenever I can earn two marks, I have got to earn them. Maybe he will even give more. He suddenly let go of me again. A vestibule no longer smelled of peace and security. The world was tumbling down around me. He was going to turn me in. I was a criminal. My father would be informed. 
maybe the police would actually come all the terrors of chaos threatened me everything ugly and dangerous was mustered up against me that i hadn't really stolen anything was completely beside the point on the top of that i had sworn an oath oh my god my god tears welled up in my eyes i felt that i had to buy myself off and i rummaged desperately through all my pockets there was nothing in them not an apple not a pocket knife then i remembered my watch it was an old silver watch and it didn't go i wore it just for the sake of it it came from a grandmother i quickly pulled it out chroma i said listen you must not turn me in that wouldn't be nice of you i will give you my watch unfortunately i have nothing else you can have it it's silver and the works are good it just has a minor defect it has to be repaired he smiled and took the watch into his large hand i looked at that hand and felt how rough and deeply hostile it was to me how it was reaching out for my life and my peace of mind it's silver i said timidly i don't give a hoot for your silver or that watch of yours he said with profound contempt get it repaired yourself but franz i exclaimed trembling with the fear that he might run away please wait a minute do take the watch it's real silver really and truly and i just don't have anything else he looked at me with cool contempt in that case you know who i'm going to see or i can also tell the police about it i'm well acquainted with the sergeant he turned around to leave i held him back by the sleeve it must not be i would much rather have died than bear all that wound and see you if he left like that franz i pleaded hoarse with agitation don't do anything silly it's just a joke right yes a joke but one that can cost you dear then franz tell me what i should do you know i will do anything he surveyed me with his half shut eyes and laughed again don't be stupid he said with false born homie you know what's what just the same as i do i can earn two marks and i'm not so rich that i can throw them away you know it but you are rich you even have a watch all you need to do is give me the two marks and that will be that i understood his logic but two marks for me it was just as much and just as impossible to get as a 10 a 100 a 1000 marks i had no money there was a little money savings box in my mother's room that contained a few pennings and five pennings coins from uncle's visits and similar occasions otherwise i have nothing at that age i wasn't yet receiving any allowance i have nothing i said sadly i have no money at all but aside from that i will give you anything i have a book about indians and soldiers and a compox i will get it for you chroma merely twitched his brazen malicious lips and spat on the floor don't babble he said imperiously you can keep your junk a compass don't make me angry now too all right and hand over the money but i don't have any i never get money i just can't help it well then you will bring me the two marks tomorrow after school i will be waiting down in the market and that's that if you don't bring money you will see yes but where am i to get it my god if i don't have any you have got money enough in the house that's your affair so then tomorrow after school and i'm telling you if you don't bring it he darted a frightening look into my eyes spat again and disappeared like a ghost i was unable to go upstairs 
my life was wrecked. I thought about running away and never coming back or drowning myself, but I had no clear images of that. In the darkness, I sat down on the lowest step of the staircase, withdrew deeply into myself and surrendered myself to my misfortune. Lena found me crying there when she came downstairs with a basket to fetch wood. I asked her not to say anything upstairs and I went up. On the rack beside the glass shore hung my father's hat and my mother's parasol. Domesticity and tenderness radiated to me from all those objects. My heart greeted them beseechingly and gratefully, just as the prodigal son greeted the sight and smell of the old rooms in his home. But now all of that was no longer mine. It was all part of the bright world of my father and mother, and I had sunk, guilt-laden, deep into the strange waters, entangled in intrigue and sin, threatened by my enemy and a prey to perils, anxiety, and shame. The head and parasol, the good old freestone floor, the big picture over the vestibule closet, and the voice of my older sister coming from the pallor, all that was dearer, more gentle and precious than ever, but it no longer spelled consolation and solid possession. It was nothing but reproach. All that was no longer mine. I couldn't participate in its serenity and tranquility. There was dirt on my shoes that I couldn't scrape off on the mat. I carried shadows along with me that were unknown to the world of my home. I had had plenty of secrets in the past, plenty of anxiety, but that was all a game and a joke in comparison with what I was carrying with me into these rooms today. Fate was hounding me, hands were reaching out at me from which my mother couldn't protect me, of which she shouldn't even learn. Whether my crime was a theft or a lie, hadn't I sworn a false oath by God and my salvation? Didn't matter. My sin wasn't any particular action. My sin was having given my hand to the devil. Why had I gone along? Why had I obeyed Cromer more readily than I ever obeyed my father? Why had I concocted that story about stealing? Why had I boasted about crimes as they were such heroic deeds? Now the devil had me by the hand. Now my enemy was after me. For a moment, what I felt was no longer fear about the next day. But above all the terrible certainty that my path now led farther and farther downhill and into darkness, I perceived distinctly that my transgression must necessarily be followed by new transgressions, that rejoining my sisters, greeting and kissing my parents was a lie, that I was carrying a destiny and secret with me that I was concealing within me. For a moment, trust and hope blazed up in me when I contemplated my father's head. I would tell him everything. I would accept his sentence and his punishment and make him confident and rescuer. It would only be a penance of the sort that I had often undergone. A difficult, bitter hour, a difficult and repentant request for forgiveness. What a sweet sound that had, how appealing and tempting it was. But nothing came out of it. I knew I wouldn't do it. I knew that now I had a secret, a guilt that I had to swallow on my own, all by myself. Perhaps I was at the crossroads right now. Perhaps from this time on I would belong to the bad element forever and ever. Sharing secrets with evil people, depending on them, obeying them, necessarily becoming like them. I had played the role of a grown man, of a hero, 
Now I had to endure the consequences. I was glad that when I walked in, my father dwelt on my wet shoes. It was a diversion. He didn't notice what was worse. And I was allowed to undergo a reproach which I secretly applied to all the rest. As that happened, a strangely novel feeling was aroused in me. A malicious, corrosive feeling full of barbs. I felt superior to my father. For the space of a moment, I felt a certain contempt for his ignorance. His scolding on account of my wet shoes seemed petty to me. If you only knew, I thought. And I felt like a criminal being interrogated about a stolen bread roll, whereas he could have confessed to murders. It was an ugly, repellent feeling. But it was strong and had a profound attractiveness, more than any other notion. It chained me more tightly to my secret and my guilt. Perhaps, I thought, Cromer has already gone to the police and turned me in, and storm clouds are gathering over me while I am being treated here like a little child. Out of that whole experience, to the extent that I have narrated it up to here, that moment was the most important and lasting element. It was the first rift in my father's sanctity. It was the first nick in the pillars on which my childish life had rested and which every human being must destroy before he can become himself. It is of these experiences invisible to everyone that the sinner, essential line of our destiny consists. That kind of rift and nick closes over again. It is healed and forgotten. But in the most secret chamber of the mind, it continues to live and bleed. I myself was immediately terrified by this new feeling. I could have kissed my father's feet right away in order to apologize to him for it. But nothing so fundamental can be apologized for. And a child feels and knows that just as well and profoundly as any wise man does. I felt the need to think over my situation, to make plans for the following day. But I didn't get that far. I was occupied that entire evening solely by getting used to the altered atmosphere in a parlor. It was as if the wall and the clock and the table, the Bible and the mirror, the bookshelf and the pictures on the wall were saying goodbye to me. With a heart growing cold, I had to watch my world, my good, happy life, becoming the past and detaching itself from me. I had to perceive that I was anchored and held fast outside in the unfamiliar darkness by thirsty new roots. For the first time, I tasted death, and death tastes bitter because it is birth. It is anxiety and terror in the face of a frightening innovation. I was happy when I was finally lying in my bed. Before that, as my final purgatory, I had had to enter our evening prayers, during which we had sung a hymn that was one of my favorites. Oh, I didn't join in, and every note was gal and warm wood to me. I didn't join the prayer when my father spoke the blessing and when he ended upon us all. I was convulsively torn out of their circle. The grace of God was upon them all, but no longer upon me. I left, cold and enormously weary. In bed, after lying there a while, lovingly enveloped, in warmth and security, my heart in its fear wandered back again, fluttering anxiously over what had occurred. As always, my mother had said good night to me. Her steps still echoed in the room. The glow of her candle still shone through the opening in the door. 
Now I thought, now she will come back again. She smell what's going on. She will give me a kiss and she will ask me about it. Ask me kindly and promisingly, and then I'll be able to cry. Then the stone in my throat will melt. Then I will throw my arms around her and tell her everything. Then things will be all right. Then I will be saved. And when the door opening had already grown dark, I still listened a while and thought that it just had to happen. Then I returned to reality and looked my enemy in the eye. I saw him clearly. He had half shut one eye. His mouth was laughing coarsely, and while I looked at him and bitterly acknowledged the inevitable, he became bigger and uglier, and his malicious eyes flashed devilishly. He was right beside me until I fell asleep, but then I didn't dream about him or that day's events. Instead. I dreamt we were sailing in a boat, my parents and sisters and I, surrounded by the perfect peace and glow of a holiday. In the middle of the night, I awoke, still feeling the aftertaste of bliss, still seeing my sisters' white summer dresses shimmering in the sunlight, and I relapsed from all that paradise into the reality of my situation. Once more, I was confronting my enemy. With his malicious eyes, in the morning, when my mother arrived hastily, calling out that it was already late and asking why I was still in bed, I looked sick. When she asked if anything was wrong with me, I vomited. That seemed like a small gain for me. I very much liked being slightly ill and being able to stay in bed all morning with chamomile tea. Listening to my mother tidying up in the next room and to Lena greeting the butcher out in the vestibule, a morning without school was something enchanted, like a fairy tale. The sun would poke around in the room, and it wasn't the same sun that we shut out in the school by lowering the green curtains. But even that had no savor today; it had taken on a false note. Yes. If only I had died, but I was merely a little unwell, as often in the past, and nothing was accomplished thereby. It protected me from school, but it in no way protected me from Cromer, who would be waiting for me in the market around eleven. And this time, my mother's friendliness offered no comfort. It was burdensome, and it hurt. Soon I pretended to be asleep again, and I thought things over. There was no help for it. I had to be in the market at eleven, and so I got up quietly at ten and said that I felt well again, as usual in such instances. It meant that I either had to go back to bed or attend school in the afternoon. I said I would like to go to school. I had devised a plan. I couldn't meet Cromer without money on me. I had to get my hands on the little money box that belonged to me. There wasn't enough money in it. I was well aware, not nearly enough, but it was still something, and a premonition told me that something was better than nothing, and that Cromer had to be at least pacified. I was in low spirits when I crept into my mother's room in my stocking feet and took my box out of her desk, but it wasn't as bad as the events of the previous day. The pounding of my heart choked me, and it didn't get better when, down in the stairwell, I discovered on my first investigation that the box was locked. It was very easy to break it open. I merely had to rip apart a thin, thin grating, but it hurt me to rip it open, because it was only then that I had committed a theft. Up until then, I had merely flitched some tidbit, sugar lumps of fruit, but this was stealing. 
even if it was my own money. I felt that I had taken one more step nearer to Cromer and his world, that bit by bit I was fairly headed downhill, and I retorted by defiance, let the devil carry me away. Now there was no turning back. I counted the money fearfully. While it was in the box, it had sounded like such a lot. But now in my hand, there was miserably little of it. It came to 65 fannings. I hid the box in the vestibule, held the money in my clenched fist and left the house. Feeling different from any other time I had walked through the gate. From upstairs someone called after me. It seemed I departed swiftly. There was still plenty of time. I sneaked by roundabout paths through the narrow streets of a changed town. Beneath clouds never before seen. Past houses that looked at me and people who were suspicious of me. On the way, I recalled that one of my school chums had once found a teller coin in the cattle market. I would gladly have prayed to God to perform a miracle and let me make such a fine too. But I no longer had any right to pray, and even so, the money box wouldn't have been made whole again. Franz Cromer saw me from a distance, but he walked toward me very slowly seeming to pay no attention to me. When he was close to me, he signaled to me imperiously to follow him and continued walking calmly without looking around even once, down straw lane and over the footbridge until halting among the last houses in front of a construction site. No work was going on there. The wall stood there bare without doors or windows. Cromer looked around and went in through the doorway, and I followed. He stepped behind the wall, beckoned me over, and held out his hand. Have you got it? He asked coolly. I drew my clenched fist out of my pocket and shook out my money onto the flat of his hand. He had counted it even before the last five pennings piece stopped clinking. This is 65 pennies, he said, and he looked at me. Yes, I said timidly. It's all I have. I know it's not enough, but that's all there is. I have no more. I would have thought you were smarter, he said, scolding me almost gently. Between men of honor, things should be orderly. I don't want to take anything from you unjustly. You know that. Take back your small change. That other man, you know who, won't try to beat down my price. He will pay. But I simply don't have any more. This came from my money box. That's your affair. I don't want to drive you to despair. You still owe me one mark and 35 pennings. When will I get it? Oh, you will definitely get it, Cromer. I don't know right now. Maybe I will have more soon, tomorrow or the day after. You realize I can't talk to my father about it. That doesn't concern me. I'm not the type to want to do you harm. After all, I could get my money before noon, see? And I'm poor. You're wearing nice clothes. You got better stuff to eat for lunch than I do. But I say no more. For my part, I can wait a while. Day after tomorrow, I will whistle for you in the afternoon. Then you will settle up. Do you know my whistle? He performed it for me. I have heard it often. Yes, I said, I know. He went away as if I had nothing to do with him. It had been a business transaction between us. Nothing more. Even today, I think Cromer's whistle would give me a start if I heard it again suddenly. From that time on, I heard it frequently. I seemed to be hearing it constantly. There was no place, no game, no task, no thought that that whistle didn't pierce through. It robbed me of my independence. It was now my faith. 
I spent a lot of time in a little flower garden, which I loved during the gentle, colorful autumn afternoons. And the peculiar urge led me to play childish games of earlier years one more. To some extent, I was playing the role of a boy younger than I was actually. A boy still good and free, innocent and secure. But in the midst of it, always unexpected and yet always frightfully disrupted and surprising, Cromer's whistle came from somewhere or other, cutting the thread, destroying the illusions. Then I had to go, had to follow my tormentor to bad, ugly places, had to make an accounting to him and be done for money. The whole thing lasted a few weeks, perhaps, but it felt to me like years or an eternity. I seldom had money, a five or ten fanning coin stolen from the kitchen table when Lena left her shopping basket lying there. Each time, Cromer walled me out and heaped scorn on me. I was the one who wanted to fool him and cheat him out of what was duly his. I was the one who was stealing from him. I was the one who was making him miserable. Not often in my life have I taken my distress so much to heart. Never have I experienced greater hopelessness or loss of independence. I had filled the money box with game tokens and put it back where it was. No one asked about it, but that, too, could come down around my ears any day. Even more than Cromer's vulgar whistle, I often feared my mother when she walked up to me softly. Wasn't she coming to ask me about the money box? Since I had presented myself to my devil without money a number of times, he began to torture and exploit me in another way. I had to work for him. He had to make deliveries for his father and I had to make them for him. Or else he commanded me to perform some difficult feat, to hop on one leg for 10 minutes or attach a scrap of paper to a passerby's coat. Many nights in dream, I continued suffering these torments and lay bathed in sweat from those nightmares. For a while, I became ill. I vomited frequently and was subject to chills, though at night, I was very sweaty and feverish. My mother felt that something was wrong and displayed a lot of sympathy, which tortured me because I couldn't repay her with my confidence. One evening, when I was already in bed, she bought me a piece of chocolate. That was a reminiscence of earlier years in which on many evenings, when I had been well behaved, I had received similar comforting tidbits at bedtime. Now she stood there and held out the piece of chocolate to me. I felt so bad that all I could do was shake my head. She asked what was wrong with me and stroked my hair. I could merrily blurt out, No, no, I don't want anything. She put the chocolate on the night table and left. When she tried to ask me about it on the following day, I pretended I didn't remember anything about it. Once she sent for the doctor to see me, he examined me and left instructions that I should wash in cold water every morning. My condition in that period was a sort of insanity. In the midst of a household, orderly, peaceful existence, I was living as frightened and tormented as a ghost. I didn't participate in the life of the others and really took my mind off my troubles even for an hour. With my father, who was often irritated and questioned me, I was cold and reserved.